Warning, the video you're about to watch contains mathematics at the level of college algebra and trigonometry. All material has an assumed prerequisite of both Algebra 1, which is elementary algebra, and Algebra 2, which is intermediate algebra. While some prerequisite topics are reviewed briefly, a more thorough review of these entrance topics can be found by searching the web. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is another video in the series on graphing polar equations. In this video, we're going to focus on graphing polar functions of the form r of theta is equal to a sine of theta plus d or the same equation with a cosine. These are likely the most popular forms of polar functions that you will see both in calculus and also in pre-calculus and in trigonometry. So these are the ones I focus a little more on than the others. The others get a little bit either simpler or more complex, but these are right smack dab in the middle as far as difficulty level. The technique to graphing this style of function is the same as how I've been graphing the other um, polar functions. So let's go ahead and tackle this here. And by the way, I also have written this slightly backwards. This is how most authors would write a polar equation. R is equal to constant plus constant times trig function. In trigonometry, when you graph trig equations, it's always the other way around or should be. And so in this case, I'm going to graph in the Cartesian coordinate system, Y is equal to two times the, what are we dealing with? Cosine of X plus four. That's generally how I like to write my equations, especially in the Cartesian coordinate system, mainly because it I read things from left to right, and that's the best way to set these functions up for success for graphing. Now to remind ourselves of how graphing works in the Cartesian coordinate system, we know that two would be the amplitude of our function, and four would be the vertical shift of our cosine function. And so I will go ahead and take my time, not a lot of time, just enough time to really get a good idea of what this curve looks like and get a decent graph of it going. Now, if you're one of my students, you know that I always start with the vertical shift. This is Y equals four. And then uh, normally I would plot the phase shift and all this other stuff. There is no phase shift. There's no adjustment to the period or anything like that. So this is just going to be the regular cosine curve and it's not upside down. So I'll go ahead and graph the regular cosine curve. You know, to be super accurate about it, just accurate enough. And we know that the Y axis is right there. And let's we'll see, the amplitude is two, the midline is four. So the maximum is two plus four or six. And the minimum is two is four minus two, which is two. And therefore the X axis, and this is very important. The X axis is down here. It is incredibly important. In fact, that you are accurate as to where your X axis is in this situation. Now you could label your angles here. So remember that this is the angle of two pi, and this is the angle of pi, and this is the angle of pi over two. And now what we'll do, obviously this is the angle of three pi over two. We're just going to do what we did in the previous video. We're going to say, if I'm facing an angle of zero, how far out am I throwing a rock in front of me? Oh, and also I should plot the uh, pole and the polar axis here. So let's just do that. So now back here, if I'm facing an angle of zero radians, how far am I throwing a rock in front of you, in front of me? And it's six feet in front of me. So I'll start there. I'm facing an angle of zero. Basically I'm facing the polar axis. I'm going to plot a point one, two, three, four, five, and six units in front of me. There we go. And now let's see what happens. As we turn through an angle approaching pi over two, those rocks still get thrown pretty far in front of me. But once I face an angle of pi over two, they're only being thrown in front of me about four feet, right? 
right about there. So I know that there it's a decreasing distance, and by the time I'm facing the angle of pi over two, it's gonna be a rock thrown four feet in front of me. Otherwise, it's a smooth decrease in distance. So one, two, three, and four feet in front of me. But like I said, otherwise, those distances that I'm throwing rocks gets, they just get less and less and less. visualize it like this. I, I do this just because it's, I know personally that it's going to be a nice smooth curve here. So direction of travel, by the way, of my angular uh, facing looks like this. It's a path of travel of the rocks that I'm throwing, if you will. And then going back to the Cartesian graph, as I turn past an angle of pi over two, I'm still throwing rocks in front of me, right? until I reach an angle of pi. At the angle of pi, I'm throwing a rock only two feet in front of me. But guess what? The entire time I'm still throwing rocks in front of me. It's just the angles get less and less, or sorry, the distance gets less and less. So but again, by the time I'm facing this direction, a rock is only one, two feet in front of me. So this distance that I'm throwing rocks in front of me here, I didn't need to do that, it gets less and less distant. When I say distance, I mean the measuring distance here, okay? So each of these rocks gets a little bit shorter distance away from me, a little bit shorter distance away, and a little bit shorter distance away, and so on and so forth, until you get to that point right there. So it looks something like this. It does actually cave in a little bit, just a teeny little bit, at that angle of pi it just draws back to you a little bit because you're pulling you're throwing rocks at a less less distance away from you and then going back now this is where it differs quite a bit from the previous graphs in the previous video is that the graph isn't done when we reach pi once we reach pi the graph continues and there's you can see there's a beautiful symmetry to this graph so we're just essentially going to have the symmetric, like the distances start to increase and they go back to a distance of four units away from us by the time we're facing pi over three pi over two, sorry. And then as we continue to turn, we, these distances get further and further away from, from us until we're facing a distance, an angle of two pi and the distances are six. So again, it's just going to be a symmetric looking graph uh, let me do this at least one, two, three, and four. And it's going to look something like this. Now I'm trying to keep this as symmetric as possible, but I, I could fail a little bit there. All right. So again, path of travel, path of travel, path of travel, path of travel. And let me just do this. There we go. And so this is the graph of four plus two cosine of theta. And the pattern will repeat from that point forward because uh, cosine is two pi periodic. So it's just gonna constantly repeat this pattern. This, notice a few things about this. First of all, it's a cosine function. And notice that this acorn shape object most of it is on the positive x axis, and this was a positive cosine. So most of the graph is on the positive x axis and or along the positive x axis. What I mean by that is that I just I always visualize this as being mostly in the positive x axis there. I don't know why. So if that doesn't make sense to you, that's OK. But cosine is associated with x and we're x heavy, if you will. All right, let's try another example. Graph the function three times the quantity of one minus the sine of theta. And that's R equals, by the way. By the way, when somebody says R equals and then something with theta, it's polar coordinates automatically, okay? Um, so let's graph that function. The first thing I'm gonna do is actually rewrite it. I'm gonna rewrite it as R is equal to three minus three sine of theta. That's just a safer way to write that. And then I'm going to graph its Cartesian coordinate sister over here. Y is equal to negative 3 sine of theta plus 3. 
I just like to write it in that order. They're actually the same functions. I just write it in a different order there. And we'll go ahead and graph in the midline. This has been vertically shifted up three units and it's an upside down sign uh, with amplitude three. So I'll pause the video and graph that very quickly. So there's our upside, upside down sign function. Oops, and it's supposed to be sign of X, sorry about that. There's our upside down sign function. It's been lifted up three units. And we're gonna go ahead and draw in here the X axis. Now, because the amplitude of this function is actually three, and it's been lifted three units, we know that the maximum will be at three plus three or six, and the minimum will be at three minus three or zero. So we know where our X axis is, it's just right there. Oops, let me get rid of my ruler because otherwise it'll have me right on the ruler the entire time. There's our X axis. And now I'll just label these points. That's pi, here's two pi. This angle will be representative of three pi over two, and there's pi over two right there. Now I will go ahead and plot my pole and the polar axis. And do the same thing I've been doing all along. When I face an angle of zero, I'm throwing a rock in front of me, three units. And as I turn, those rocks get closer and closer to my feet until at an angle of pi, they are directly at my feet. So. Let's see how that looks over here. Uh, let's see, I'm facing an angle zero. I'm gonna throw a rock in front of me, one, two, three feet. And then by the time I've turned over to an angle of pi over two, the rock is at my feet. And it'll be a nice smooth curve. It's just these rocks, the distances just get a little bit less and less and less and less and less and less and less. You can measure out these distances if you want to. They are actually getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It's just not easy to see, but they totally are. So let me go ahead and give this path of travel here, just like this. And then we'll go back. Now we're facing an angle of pi over two. What happens? Well, as I turn past an angle of pi over two, whoa, how nice, I start throwing rocks in front of me again until I'm facing an angle of pi and those rocks are three feet in front of me. Okay, well, let's see what happens. So this is an interesting graph. Okay, so uh, I'm now facing this direction, right? And as I turn through the angles here, I'm gonna throw rocks in front of me again. So this curve kind of does this weird bounce right there. And by the time I'm facing the angle of pi, I have a rock three feet in front of me. Let me make sure that looks like the same distance. It kind of doesn't, does it? Uh, so maybe right about, I guess that's, I guess that's okay. So again, I'm gonna start throwing rocks in front of me as I turn through this angle. And by the time I'm facing pi, there we go. I have a rock three feet in front of me. So it somewhat looks like this trying to be somewhat accurate again. So this is kind of an interesting graph, right? Because what it did is it went around and then bounced here and went back. It's supposed to be symmetric, but my graph is not beautiful. I totally get that. Maybe I'll do it like that so I can get a little symmetry in there. There you go. Not the best, but whatever. And then as I turn past the angle of pi, I actually continue to increase the distance that I'm throwing rocks in front of me until I'm facing the angle of three pi over two where they're six feet in front of me. So this is interesting. By the time I'm facing an angle of three pi over two, the rocks are one, two, three, four, five, and six feet in front of me. So I'm increasing the distance that I'm throwing the rocks away from me until I get to this distance of this angle of three pi over two. Trying my best to get a nice smooth curve in there. That looks good. And there's my path of travel. 
And you could see what's actually developing here. As we turn past the angle of 3 pi over 2, now I'm throwing rocks in front of me, but the distances are getting shorter and shorter until they're 3 feet in front of me at the angle of 2 pi. So basically, I'll end here. And it's going to be symmetric. So I'm just going to graph this out just like that. And the angle of the path of travel. And we get a heart. That is actually, honestly, one of the most important curves in polar graphs right there. It's called the cardioid, which we'll mention that later on, but it makes sense that it'd be called a cardioid because it's a heart shaped curve. But notice the way we graph that is the same way that I've been graphing all the previous polar curves. Just graph it in Cartesian coordinates and then go ahead and uh, plot the points as if you're throwing rocks in front of you. One other thing I want to draw your attention to, again, like I have been, this is the sine function, which is associated with y. And notice most of that heart is in the y direction there, in the negative y direction, in fact. So yet little patterns that I just want you to pick up as we go through graphing. Let's try another example. And each one of these examples is given for a very specific reason. So let's go ahead and see what the reason is for this one. R is equal to one plus four cosine of theta. Now, if the pattern continues with what we've been seeing so far, this should be some type of curve where it's heavy on the positive x-axis. Let's see if that's going to be the case. All right. So uh, again, writing this in Cartesian form, y is equal to four times the cosine of x plus one. Well, let's draw that out. That's just a cosine curve, normal cosine curve, lifted up one unit and has an amplitude of four. I'll graph that quickly. So here's that curve, y equals four cosine of x plus one. It's just a cosine curve lifted up one unit, like I said earlier, but it has an amplitude of four. Notice there's something interesting about this curve, it's the fact that it goes negative at some point. So that's going to be interesting for us. I'm just labeling the angles here because they'll be very helpful. All right. So let's start uh, by plotting the pole. And here's the polar axis. Whoops, except it should be horizontal. Let me actually just use this for a horizontal uh, line because that is a little more helpful, I think. All right that out of the way let's go ahead and start throwing rocks uh angle of zero i throw a rock five feet in front of me so i'll start there and you could probably see the pattern at this point i actually only worry about the axial angles or the quadrantal angles one two three four and five feet in front of me and then what i'll do is i'll just quickly get myself to the angle of pi over two the other quadrantal angle or one of the other quadrantal angles. So again, throwing rocks in front of me, they'll get closer and closer to me until when I'm facing an angle of pi over two, they're one foot in front of me. So I throw a rock a foot in front of me when I'm facing an angle of pi over two. So basically like that. Otherwise, you have these rocks that are far away from you, but they get closer and closer as you're turning. So it bows in here and maybe not that quickly <laughs> something like this okay so now i'm going to go ahead and connect up this dotted piece it takes a little bit of experience to kind of see how this is going to go because the reality is some people make really sloppy graphs i mean terribly sloppy graphs and uh you want to be somewhat accurate here uh, and notice I'm not using technology at all as far as uh, to get you to visualize this. All I'm doing is drawing by hand. That's ex exactly what I would expect my students to do, draw by hand. All right. Now, something interesting happens in a moment here. We're going to turn past this angle of pi over 2. And pretty soon after we turn past that angle of pi over 2, we're dropping rocks at our feet. So it, it really sucks to our, you know, like as we start turning... Like here's an angle and here's an angle and we keep turning eventually and very quickly. In fact, those rocks that we're throwing out approach our feet 
So it's something like this. It just sucks into our, you know, we drop a rock very quickly to our feet. All right, now what happens beyond there? We don't know what that angle is, and that's okay. After that very special angle, we then start throwing rocks behind us as we turn to finally face the angle of pi. And when we face the angle of pi, we're throwing a rock three feet behind us. Let me say that again. By the time we're facing an angle of pi, we will have thrown a rock three feet behind us. Now, what the heck is happening? Well, as I turn past, let's just say this angle where I dropped a rock at my feet. Let's say that's this angle right here, okay? So as I turn past that angle, so I'm facing this angle, I start throwing rocks behind me. I go past this angle, I'm throwing a rock behind me. And I go past that angle, I'm throwing a rock behind me. I go past that angle, I'm throwing a rock behind me. And by the time I am facing pi, I have thrown rocks all the way three feet behind me. So it looks something like this. Really interesting curve so far. Well, what happens if we go beyond the angle of pi? I'm still throwing rocks behind me until I get to this really special angle that's before three pi over two. And here's where you can kind of use the symmetry of the situation, but I'm facing, so I started with facing pi and I threw a rock three feet behind me. Now I'm gonna face here and I'm throwing a rock behind me and facing this direction and I'm throwing a rock behind me but it's getting closer and closer and I'm facing this direction and I'm throwing a rock behind me but this time it's super close so you can see the path of travel it's very symmetric here and eventually by the time I'm almost facing 3 pi over 2 I'm not facing 3 pi over 2 yet because that's uh we the, we drop the rock at our feet prior to getting to the angle of three pi over two. By the time we're facing three pi over two, actually, we're throwing rocks in front of us again. In fact, by the time we face the angle of three pi over two, <clears throat> a rock is being thrown a foot in front of us. So now, if I face the angle of three pi over two, I'm gonna throw a rock one foot in front of us, which I should have drawn in blue, so I will. So you have this very short path of travel here just say it's right there because I want the symmetry and you could see there's going to be symmetric from that point forward but you could do the same argument for all of those uh, rock throwing businesses right and you get this picture right here again when we started the problem and that was me by the way just finishing out throwing rocks in front of me as I turned through an angle of two pi as we mentioned at the beginning of the problem we said that it's should be, if patterns continue, heavy on the x-axis, specifically the positive x-axis. And if you take a look at this, it totally is heavy on the positive x-axis. So there we go. That is a really good graph of that uh, structure, which we'll have a name for in a different video. I don't want you to memorize names right now. I just want you to get used to graphing right now. The final graph we're going to do of this type, which is the most important type where it's um, some number plus or minus some number times sine or cosine is this guy right here. They're all the same graphs. I just didn't want to continually do it like 57 graphs or some silliness like that. So we'll go ahead and quickly graph. This is y equals six sine of X minus three. This one differs slightly from the previous group only in that the constant is negative. So notice the first example we did, the constant was four. Second example we did, the constant was positive three. The last example we did was the constant was positive one. So the question is, will that negative three really screw things up? I mean, I think this should be a, a y, positive y axis heavy curve, but will that minus three just destroy the entire curve? Well, let's find out. I'm gonna quickly pause the video and graph that six sine of x minus three. And there we go, just using our prereq skills of graphing trig functions, we get to that point right there. That's a positive six sine of x minus three. You can see that there are going to be times when we're throwing rocks in front of us and behind us. For the most part, we're throwing rocks behind us this entire time. 
So you could see like, for example, when we face the angle of zero, we're throwing a rock behind us, throwing a rock behind us, throwing a rock behind us, throwing a rock behind us. And suddenly we drop a rock at our feet. This is well before we throw a rock far in front of us at the angle of pi over two. So let's go ahead and graph a pole and the polar axis. And there we go. And so we'll start by facing the angle zero and throwing rocks behind us. We start by throwing a rock three feet behind us. So let's go ahead and mark that out. Uh, I'm going to be somewhat careful about this because I could see the distances here are gonna go from three to negative nine. So I want to make sure I scale things so they're not out of control. So facing this way, I'm gonna drop or throw a rock one, two, three feet behind us okay now what happens well as i turn to try to face the angle of pi over two those rocks are going to get closer to my feet but they're still behind me but they're going to get closer to my feet but before i get to the angle of pi over two and by my graph it looks like maybe a third of the way through so basically by the time i'm facing maybe this direction i drop a rock at my feet but prior to that, I'm still throwing rocks behind me. They're just getting closer. So it might look something like this. That's the path of travel of the rocks that I'm throwing out there. Now what happens? I'm still not facing pi over two. I still have to increase my angle. But as I go past that point and rotate, my rocks that I'm throwing out there are going out in front of me all the way to three feet in front of me. So... By the time I'm facing the angle of pi over two, I have rocks that are one, two, three feet in front of me. So I'll say this is one, two, and three feet in front of me. And it's gonna basically have that same look to it because, well, it's the same distance out there and everything. Okay, well, so far this looks kind of weird. Let's see what happens. Again, as I turn past the angle of pi over 2, I'm still throwing rocks in front of me until I get to an angle that's near to pi, but not pi, and I start dro dropping rocks at my feet. So again, I'm by the time I get to an angle that's near to pi, but not exactly pi, maybe facing that direction, I finally have dropped a rock at my feet again. So it's we're basically dropping rocks, getting closer and closer uh, to something like that okay so this is really looking weird now this doesn't look right to us right you look at that and you're like this is totally kind of a weird looking curve and then you note once you get past that angle you start throwing rocks behind you until you're facing the angle of pi and they're three feet behind you so again i'm facing this direction and i start throwing rocks behind me and throwing rocks behind me. And by the time I'm facing pi, they're three feet behind me. So again, throw rocks behind me and behind me and so on and so forth. By the time I'm facing pi, they're three feet behind me. So I'm gonna say it's like this, very symmetric. Get rid of this red here. Okay, so something magical is happening because there is some symmetry going on. And then the bulk of it happens at this point as i turn past pi i continue to throw rocks behind me until i get to three pi over two and they're at nine feet behind me so by the time i'm facing three pi over two i'm throwing a rock this way three feet or nine feet so here is one two three four five six seven eight and let's just say that's nine let me zoom out yeah okay so as we turn remember we're turning past pi so we're facing this direction and then this direction and then this direction so on and so forth and by the time we face directly southward at three pi over two we're throwing a rock nine feet behind us and that's a slow growth of distances it's not like all of a sudden you threw something nine feet behind you so it's, everything's slowly growing to become this distance of nine feet behind so here's the passive path of travel 
And you might expect, and you'd be absolutely right, that there's this symmetry, so it's just gonna continue this pattern and be the same on the other side. There we go. Now, a lot of people, when they teach this, they build out tables of values, but I don't think that's very helpful. What you need is to develop a graphical intuitive sense of how things work. And part of that is noticing, again, we started this problem saying, well, we want this to be, I think, heavy on the y-axis, the positive y-axis, and look, it is. So that minus three really didn't change the graph. What it did was change where we start graphing, but in reality, the graph of three plus the sine of theta would be the same exact graph. You would just start graphing at a different point than where we started graphing. In fact, you would start graphing here instead of here. But that's the only difference between those two graphs. It's just where you start. So there you go. There's a full graph of that. So we've done all the graphs that are of the form a plus or minus b sine of theta or cosine of theta. And those all get different names that we'll name in a later video. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace. Listen close. Too much that isn't cold Sure, you may really hurt inside It doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry